Hello there, humans. A few weeks ago or sometime, I mentioned that, quote, Zazen is good for nothing, which is attributed to Kodo Sawaki Roshi, who was one of my uh, teacher's teachers. And the full quote, as is usually reported, is, what is Zazen good for? Good for nothing. As long as this good for nothing practice does not penetrate our bones and we really practice what is good for nothing, it won't be good for anything. And in that video, I mentioned how Shohaku Okumura had come up with that translation, good for nothing, when he was working at a, uh, some kind of a farm picking blueberries and they, the manager or whoever, the overseer, they, there were dogberries and blueberries growing in the same area and dogberries are apparently no good because they can't be eaten. And he would say, don't pick those good-for-nothing dogberries. Uh, and Shohaku Okumura realized the idea of dogberries being good for nothing and blueberries being good for something was the fact that dogberries are inedible and therefore can't be sold. So they're, they're very pretty and they just grow and they're just another berry in the, you know, the world. But they're not, for humans, good for anything. And the blueberries are good for something because they're, you know, they're, they, they can be sold and people can eat them. And this is, he was comparing to the practice of Zazen being good for nothing. It's not good for anything but its own self. It is what it is. And it's not some practice that you do in order to make another thing happen. I should go see what Ziggy's barking at. I don't know what he was barking at. I went over there and I couldn't see anything. Anyhow, Thanks to Muho, the former abbot of Antaiji, uh, who lives in Japan in Osaka now, I found out what Kodo Sawaki actually said, which is, Zazen shite nani ni narimasu ka? Zazen shite mo nani mo naran. Kono nani mo naran koto ga mimi ni tako ga dekite, honto ni nani mo naran koto o tada suru yo ni naraneba, honto ni nani mo naran. That's what he said. And what Shohaku Okumura came up with, I think, is a brilliant translation. It really captures what Kodo Sowaki said in idiomatic English, but it's not a direct translation. If you were going to look for a, a translation that gives you exactly, you know, in precise terms, what Kodo Sowaki actually said, mm, that's a little bit difficult. It's, it's like... Uh, if I do Zazen, what will I become? Uh, if you, even if you do Zazen, you won't become anything. This won't become anything until this won't become anything thing. <laughs> Koto is a very difficult word to translate. Uh, is is so ingrained in you that that calluses grow on your ears because you've heard it so much, and the the truly not nothing becoming nothing becomes like your you know seeps all the way into you then it truly will become nothing <laughs> you know so if you do a direct translation it's a big mess is basically what i'm saying the reason i bring this up is because one of the most fascinating things to me about buddhism in its early phases was that it was an oral tradition so for the first 200 years that Buddhism existed, none of it was written down. And, and this was a time when Indians in India had a system of writing and were writing things all the time. And there were great works of religious literature that already existed by the time that Buddhism was first propagated. So they could have written it down, but they didn't. And I was always kind of wondering why. Now, there was a strong oral tradition of memorizing, supposedly what happened is they memorized the Buddha's words and then recited these in, in groups so as to preserve them for long periods of time. And there was a tradition of that. Also, even though literature existed and writing existed, maybe not as many people were able to read back then as can now. So, and, and, and even if you could read, you couldn't just go to a Barnes and Noble and get the book. You know, the books were very scarce things and you know, uh, they had to be preserved very carefully and not everybody could look at them even if they were able to read them. So maybe it was felt that it was more egalitarian to keep it as an oral tradition so that everybody could share it and it wasn't preserved for the elite who could who could read or who could uh, afford to possess books that answer i like but another answer that i like is that 
Buddhism needs to be an oral tradition because the the written word doesn't really preserve all the nuances of a teaching. And so what the Buddhists wanted to do is preserve the actual essence of the teaching by by giving it from teacher to disciple and keeping it that way so that the tradition would actually change the wording of of the most important points of Buddhist philosophy, there's Ziggy's running around like crazy in the ivy over there, uh, would, would change. Hey Ziggy, how you doing? How you doing Ziggy? So rather than fixing the tradition in a, a form that would be preserved that way forever, what they wanted to do is actually allow the tradition to change. And this is what the, the Zenis believe, you know, what, if, what Team Zen believes, if you want to believe Team Zen, is that Zen represents that that preserved oral tradition that went from teacher to student. And there is a process by which this is verified. So the, there, it's called Dharma transmission. I've talked about it before, I think. And a teacher recognizes that her or his student has matured to the level that that student is able to teach without referring back to the teacher without needing the teacher's guidance anymore and therefore they can become an independent teacher on their own and there's a certificate and there's some bowls and there's some doohickeys that you get and, and to represent this and, and everything is is uh, preserved that way this is a big contrast to the way western religions are handled there is a, a canon to the bible and i remember reading this uh, I, I assumed because the bible contains the older jewish scriptures that the jewish scriptures were canonized first and then the new testament was canonized later but that's not that's not actually the case the the new testament was the first one to be canonized and and then they decided which Jewish scriptures should go along with the Bible, and then the, the, it became a, a thing in Jewish tradition to canonize their scriptures as well. The, the Muslims take this to the, the most logical conclusion, which is that the Quran is considered to be only the Quran if it's in Arabic. So a, a translation of the Quran in English or French or German or whatever is not the true Quran. The true Quran is only in Arabic because it's fixed. It's, it's exactly those words and those words never change. Uh, Buddhism takes a whole different view on that. Now, I shouldn't say all of Buddhism does, because Theravada Buddhism does believe in the idea of, of canonizing their scriptures, and there is a, a, the Pali canon, the canon as written in the Pali language, which was not the language that Buddha actually spoke, so it was already, the Pali canon already represents a translation of a translation of a translation. I think maybe three languages it had to go through before it got to Pali. I'm not sure about that. You can uh, check me if I'm wrong about that one, but it's not the original language. In, in any case. So, uh, they, but they preserve it as a canon and they say these are the Buddha's words and only these are the Buddha's words. The Mahayana tradition, of which Zen is a part, freely adds scriptures that everybody knows were not written during Buddha's lifetime. They they claim to be the words of Buddha and his immediate disciples and conversations between them are happening all the time. But everybody knows, and, and everybody's known for a long time, that these don't date back to the original times, yet they are used as if they are just as good. Dogen was interesting in this way because he, he accepted some of the Mahayana sutras, and probably most of them, but there were certain ones he, he criticized as being these are, these are not real sutras. Uh, so there you go. He, he didn't believe all the sutras were real sutras. And he rarely uh, talks about anything from the Pali Canon. I don't think he could have read the Pali Canon, but there was a Chinese translation of it that would have been available to him, and he rarely quotes that. He, he almost always quotes only the later Mahayana sutras and the, the actual sayings of different teachers and his own teacher. So that is part of the oral tradition. This is also why, this is something that bugs people about me, is I'm always quoting Nishijima Roshi or Tim McCarthy or Ko Chino or other teachers, but this is also part of the Zen tradition, is to, is to quote your own teachers and, uh, and often to express what you've just quoted in your own words. 
because again it's an orally preserved tradition and not a tradition that is fixed in literature so you know, for all the people who every once in a while pop up on the comments say, section saying, ah, you're not teaching the real Buddhism because the real Buddhism is the Pali Canon and all that. Well, there, there's, there's a long-standing tradition that I'm, you know, part of, for, for better or worse, that, that just does it this way. And that's how it works. So there you go. That's Buddhism as an oral tradition. I hope you enjoyed that. I think I was nerding out a little bit today. Maybe I'll get to something less nerdy next time. But if you want to see something less nerdy, send me an email and send me a donation at the address you're seeing below on your screen. That is how I make my living. That is how everything works around uh, Casa Brad right here, or Casa, you know, my girlfriend's family. Uh, that is uh, really how I'm making my money. And if you don't have any money, if you're having financial troubles, don't donate. But if you are able to donate, that it really helps. And I thank all of you who are continuing to donate. And have a good time all the time. See you later. Bye.